For any size gift before Ash Wednesday, February 14th, we'll send you my 2024 Lenten devotional booklet. Make a secure online donation at thewordendoors.org or make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. And we'll send you my new devotional book for Lent, By Your Holy Cross. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF is a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, dedicated to translating and publishing the books of our Lutheran faith into more than 100 languages for our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. Learn how you can take part in their work at lhfmissions.org. Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Wheaton. What happens when Christ intervenes between a runaway slave and the aggrieved master? Everything Paul has just been writing about, love and forgiveness for those who have done us wrong, and so reconciliation together under the saving blood. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily verse-by-verse Bible study with the church past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the book of Colossians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. In our last study, you recall, Paul closed out the table of duties with an exhortation to masters, who are kind of sort of like bosses today. Masters were to treat those under their charge with justice and fairness, and always remember that they have a master, a boss, if you will, to whom they will have to give an account one day in heaven. Then, Paul moved on to some general exhortations for all Christians. He urged us to continue steadfastly in prayer, but to be watchful in it with thanksgiving. Praying can be wearying work, and the devil is happy to help us grow weary and give it up because he knows the great damage which believing prayer does to his kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. And remember how thanksgiving is the way to learn to persist in prayer. In every situation, even the direst, the darkest, you will find something for which you can give thanks. Search for it, watch for it, and then speak it out. But Paul also requested prayer for himself and Timothy. He didn't want them to pray that he'd get out of prison or be freed from execution or anything along those lines. He instead asked that they would pray for him to be given grace to declare the mystery of Christ, the saving gospel, with clarity, which is the way he ought to proclaim it. Though Paul was locked up, his charge to make known the gospel didn't change one little bit. He spread the word right where he was, right under Caesar's nose. And he wrapped up with an exhortation for them to walk similarly in wisdom toward all who are outside of Christ, who live apart from all the gifts he died to win and rose to give to us all. Our chief concern is how to buy back the time so that we can help them hear the gospel of God's grace and be saved along with us. A reading from Colossians, the fourth chapter, beginning at the seventh verse. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Colossians 4, verses 7 through 11. Let us pray. Grant, we beg you, Almighty God, to us and to your whole church, your Holy Spirit, and the wisdom that comes down from above, that your word may not be bound but a free course, and be preached and taught to the joy and the edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you, and in the confession of your name abide to our end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ready to work through today's passage? Let's dig into it. 
verse seven. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. So Tychicus was to be the bearer of this letter and also of Ephesians. See Ephesians six verse twenty one. You remember we first heard of him in Acts twenty as Paul began his final journey to Jerusalem, twenty verse four. So Peter the Berean son of Pyrrhus accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. He's also mentioned in 2 Timothy 4.12 and in Titus 3, verse 12. Besides what Paul has written to the various churches in the letters entrusted to Tychicus, he will have the scoop on the latest happenings around the apostle to share with these folks. Notice how Paul describes this man, a beloved brother, that is, a baptized Christian, and a faithful minister, in the Greek, diakonos, a deacon, and fellow servant, syndoulos, fellow slave in the Lord. Even though Paul's an apostle, and at times will vigorously defend his apostleship, you can hear that this is not out of pride. Paul can't think of anything greater than being a slave of Jesus, doing the master's bidding. And he rejoices that in that regard, Tychicus has an equal standing with him. He is a fellow slave in the service of the gospel. Verse 8. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. So Tychicus comes to them with more than one purpose. First, to deliver the letter, of course. Second, to give them the latest on what's happening with St. Paul. And thirdly, to encourage their hearts. He comes bearing the gospel in his hands, but also on his lips. Chrysostom marveled a bit over Paul's wisdom in all this before his congregation in Antioch in the 4th century. Listen. How great is the wisdom of Paul. Observe, he does not put everything in his epistles, but only things necessary and urgent. In the first place, he doesn't want his letters to be unnecessarily long. Second, his messenger will be more respected if he, too, has something personal to relate. Third, in this way, Paul demonstrates his affection for Tychicus. If he did not feel this way, he would not have entrusted him with the news of his affairs. In addition, there are some things that are best not mentioned in writing. Verse 9, And with him Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. You do remember that short letter to Philemon, don't you? Onesimus was an escaped slave whom Paul had met there in Rome and with whom he had shared the gospel, bringing him to faith, setting him free in Jesus. Paul, clever man, didn't just send the letter with Tychicus, but also with Onesimus, whom Paul was dutifully sending back to Philemon. He also is given a new title that would be read out publicly to the church there, our faithful and beloved brother. And he is one of you. That is, he's from Colossae. It's clear from the letter to Philemon that Paul wants Onesimus to be reconciled to his owner and promises, in fact, to pay off anything that Onesimus owes Philemon. The whole interaction is a fascinating glimpse into the way that Christianity exploded slavery from the inside out. What happens when Christ intervenes between a runaway slave and the aggrieved master? Everything Paul has just been writing about, love and forgiveness for those who have done us wrong, and so reconciliation together under the saving blood. And it is perhaps the presence of Onesimus that accounts for Paul giving greetings in this letter to these people he has not met in person, but still who owed their salvation, their hearing of the gospel of Christ, to Paul's ministry in Asia, the word reaching them through Epaphras. In the reading of Colossians, everyone would hear Onesimus, whose sad name, by the way, means useless, declared to be a faithful and beloved brother. And in his personal letter to Philemon, Paul would go even further. I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me 
I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. Paul would gladly have kept Onesimus with him in Rome to serve him there, but he didn't want to do that without the permission and blessing of Philemon. Hence, he sends him home, but lays a pretty heavy guilt trip on Philemon to receive the runaway as better than a slave, as a brother in Christ. Verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Verse 11, and Jesus, who is called Justice. Aristarchus, you remember, was one of the Thessalonians who accompanied Paul on the last journey. But Mark, what a joyous note this is. Mark, whom we learn here was the cousin of Barnabas, is in Rome with Paul. The last we heard of them, remember, in Acts 15, verse 36 and following, was that Paul and Barnabas separated precisely over this John Mark. Paul didn't want to have him accompany them because he turned back on the first missionary journey. But somewhere along the line, they've been reconciled and are working together at this point. We'll hear more about him in Paul's last epistle, 2 Timothy 4.11, where Paul begs Timothy to send Mark to him again since he is useful to him for ministry. We know nothing further about Jesus called justice. This is his sole mention in the New Testament. But of all these, Paul concludes, verse 11, continuing, These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Paul's ministry among the Jews had been bumpy from the get-go, and yet he had always borne in his heart a fiery love for his own nation. The great extent of that love was on full display in Romans 9 verse 3, where Paul said that if it would save his fellow Jews, he would wish even himself to be cut off from Christ. Much of Paul's ministry came to be centered on reaching out to Gentiles with the gospel, so much so that he could write in Galatians, On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. But Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, very much was comforted in his ministry and in his sufferings when he was supported by fellow Jews who had also come to believe in Jesus. Paul declares that all of these mentioned above, Tychicus, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Mark, Justice, were Christians of Jewish origin. They joined Paul in the conviction and confession that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised Messiah of the Jewish nation, but also that he was the very Savior of the entire world. That's where we're going to call our halt for today. Next time, we will finish up Colossians, see, I told you it was a short book, with its final greetings, all of whom we conclude must be Gentile believers. Greetings from Epaphras, who first shared the gospel with those folks while Paul was in Ephesus, and who continued to struggle mightily for them in prayer. Greetings from Luke, the beloved physician, the author of our gospel bearing his name. He also mentions Demas, who will disappoint Paul later in life. Paul sends greetings to those in Laodicea and instructs that the letter they receive is also to be read in Colossae and vice versa. He closes with a personal word to Archippus and then adds his signature with a reminder of his bonds for Christ. Till next time, people loved by God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. You can donate by check, make your check payable to The Word Endures, and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.